Sister Candace Miller. Thanks so much. <laughs> Sweet. Um, thanks for inviting me. Uh, special thanks to Nancy and Tracy for really opening the doors at OPSU and you know, inviting me in both to your previous meeting and also the, to the retirees group. Um, so I want to tell you, I'm not a career politician, and we're um, operating our campaign with the slogan, She's Your Nurse and Neighbor. And in the, that's, that's where I've worked and lived for 25 years. And even though I haven't maybe been an individual's nurse, I've been a nurse like on the issues. Um, I ran last year in a by-election in Toronto Centre, uh, and I came in a strong second and got the highest percent of the NDP vote in history in that riding. So, but the reason I ran was because I was taking a Toronto Star reporter up Sherburn Street. They were doing a story on Sherburn, and I said, well, instead of talking about it on the phone, let's walk it. And as we walked it, I got more and more depressed and angry because of the decimation of that community, and of course knowing it was also wrecked in other parts of Toronto. You know, hospitals gone, thanks to the Conservatives, jobs gone, dilapidated rooming houses, no new housing, I could go on and on. So I ran, uh, and I want to tell you it was a, an amazing experience, and one of my proudest moments actually was involved saving jobs, which was when the Liberals decided they were going to allow the Toronto Grace Hospital to be shut. It became front page news in the last four or five days of our campaign. And Andrea Horvath grabbed on it, we grabbed on it, the Board of Governors invited us in, we toured the hospital, we exposed it, and it got saved by, I don't know, $15 million check or something from Mr. McGinty. Uh, the other day, at an all-candidates meeting, you'll be interested to know that Glenn Murray, a liberal, was going on and on about how the Conservatives had closed hospitals. And I pointed out, you tried to close the Toronto Grace, uh, and we stopped it. And he quipped at me and said, oh, I don't need any of your cute political remarks. And I said, palliative care is not cute. And that's the kind of fighting we have to do. Now, I want you to know that an amazing thing happened in this Toronto Centre riding in May. Susan Wallace was the NDP candidate, and this is not widely known. Uh, in a very under-resourced campaign, she provided 16,000 NDP votes. Uh, probably 150 E-Day workers on E-Day. Uh, she won 125 of 250 polls. And it took a long time for CBC to declare Bob Ray the winner that night. And it was actually only by when they counted the advanced polls. So Toronto Centre is in flux. This year, um, it just felt natural to me that our campaign had to be activist-based and it had to be dealing with issues on the ground, and that was about the Stop the Cuts work, right? People raised their eyebrows and said, well, no, it's a provincial campaign, Kathy, you shouldn't do that, you can't do that, and then more and more it became clear. It became really, really clear. And I have to say that at the door, it's been, I think, one of the most important organizing tools because whether you're in pretty well-to-do Cabbage Town, they want to save the Riverdale farm, or if you're in you know, a high-rise in St. James Town or Moss Park, everyone uses libraries and recreation centers and doesn't want to see their housing sold off. And so we were able to talk about it and brought people out. So we're gonna continue to do that. And I think many of the other provincial candidates are, are beginning to see that as well. Um, so Toronto Centre, you know, is, uh, the, Mike, Michael Lewis told me the other day that he felt it was the most unusual riding in Canada, and that it's got the richest rich areas, Rosedale, Cabbage Town. It's got the highest number of co-ops, which are very progressive. It's also got the highest density communities and high-rises. And to give you an idea of just how we're working on the ground, and we are also under-resourced, I'll say, we did 60 floors in three high-rise buildings in St. Jamestown last night as a Tamil campaign. 60 floors. <laughs> For those of you, I know you've kept, most of you canvassed, it was just wild. So actually, I'm glad to be here tonight just to sit for a few minutes. <laughs> um, but so our campaign is still fighting the cuts. Um, I want to say that um, our campaign 
you know, I'm very proud that I think we're probably the only campaign that has a homeless vote coordinator. We, we did it last time and we're doing it this time. And that's somebody that's been homeless, who is working his butt off seven days a week and being paid, working to get the vote out from the drop-ins and the shelters. Um, yeah, thanks. So, I'll, I'll just kind of close, but just to say that there are in Toronto Centre, there are so many issues in Andrea Horvath and the NDP's platform that resonate uh, that I'm really proud of. We've been able to influence and make very much more progressive the housing homeless platform. Uh, we've done a child care announcement together trying to save the Bond Street uh, daycare in the riding, and I could go on and on. Uh, most importantly, though, my message is going to be the one I, I always give to Opsu. I want to thank OPSU, first of all. OPSU was the first union to second to staff to us, and it was Joe Healy initially, uh, and now it's uh, Julius Ars Arscott who's here. So thank you both. You've been working really hard. Um, and uh, both Julius and Jody, who's from CUPE on our campaign, are here. Uh, Jody's our E-Day coordinator. <clears throat> we are very under-resourced, I have to tell you. Um, we are going to try to keep building the last seven days. Um, this riding Toronto Centre was nearly won by the NDP by Carolyn Wright a number of years ago. She lost by 79 votes. This riding can totally be won, even though it's a Liberal cabinet minister. There's something changing and we can do it. So if you can help us in the last few days, and even on E-Day, come and you know talk to Jody, and Julius will be here till the end of the meeting. And we are having a special women's canvas this Saturday. It's going to go out at 10, 1, 3, and 5. So you can just join at any time. Um, I think that's it. I really honestly appreciate Opsu. You've sent me amazing workers. Uh, Crystal Straxel is out on the street right now from Opsu. And I know some of you have been phoning. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, the next uh, speaker is a, a woman that I have done some work with and I have heard speak a number of times. And I had the privilege of listening to her in a smaller venue. We were up at uh, an Ontario Federation of Labour Women's uh, Forum back in May. It seemed like December with the weather, but it was really May. Uh, and Dina was speaking about the work that she was doing and the, the kinds of issues that she was facing. And I can recall, and I think it was a sister from Ops who put up her hand, also very well behaved, and said, well, Dina, uh, like, who tells you that you can just go in and do those things that you do? And what, like, what piece of legislation are you under? And I remember her looking around the room and she said, like, no one tells me that I can do this and I'm not under any legislation. And I thought, oh, right on, like, what freedom to just go in and uh, give them help? And so that's what I really uh, love about Dina and uh, she's really inspirational and I'm thankful for her because I actually don't know what we would do without people like her. Dina Ladd. Woo! Woo! I'm going to ask my friend Mark, who's become a very good friend of mine because he's uh, good at technology and I'm pathetic, um, to show a little video. It's only a minute and a half, but it'll give you a sense of some of the work that we do at the Workers' Action Centre. That pays $265 a month. Mm -hmm. Now, something like this would cost you $1,113. So, uh, I have to pay one thousand? Yes, you have to pay about four times the monthly amount. That's including taxes. This is a straight commission sales job, straight and commission. you get paid cash every Friday. Uh, you're a separate contractor, a business owner, so you take care of your own taxes at your business. So how much do I pay for the training? 
some of the members of, of the Workers' Action Centre decided to get the local newspaper, Employment News, and a few other newspapers and, and investigate the kinds of jobs that are out there. And, and, I, uh, and that was um, just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what people found. And um, I think what's, the reason why I wanted to show this is because I think that, you know, we, we sort of think that these things don't happen here, especially for those of us who may have been in union jobs for a while. Um, but I know that, I know a number of you in this room uh, know what it's like not to have a union, know what it's like to be on contract, know, probably have family members who are in um, jobs where there are no unions and where if you've been recently unemployed, that's, that's, that's what faces you out there. And what's not there are, are temporary agencies and contract work and all the kinds of ways in which employers are hiring us right now. And so when we normally think about public services, um, you know, what comes to mind is libraries, healthcare, garbage collection, childcare. But we don't normally think about protection uh, from wage theft, um, which is what I think that is. I think if you don't get paid your wages and if you're asked to pay those fees, then that is theft because that's not right. Um, and so I think when we, when we think about violations of employment standards, of getting access to our basic you know, rights at work, like minimum wage, being able to just you know, work a healthy eight hour you know, day job, um, we don't normally think that this is connected to public services. But this video shows exactly what happens when government and when we don't invest in public services to defend our rights at work, and how cuts to public services have gone hand in hand with the deregulation of our labor market, and any confidence that workers have to rely on any basic conditions out there in, in, in jobs right now. Um, so I think, you know, this is, this is what we do at the Workers' Action Center. Um, we work with workers who don't have unions, who are in temp and contract jobs and, um, and are in the labor market with jobs like that. And we're about trying to improve public services um, in everyone's workplace and not just for those who are fortunate enough to try and get a union in their workplace. So, you know, no big surprise to any of you, I'm sure, in this room, but in the Employment Standards Branch was gutted in 1999 under Harris, Mike Harris. And this happened at the same time that workers were, more and more workers in this province were relying on employment standards, just for basic protection. Um, in fact, if you look at the last 10 years, there's been an increase of 20% of workers now relying more on employment standards. Um, and again, no big surprise, but no corresponding increase in funding uh, to ensure that those workers get their basic rights. But, you know, I have to say this um, sort of deterioration of funding um, around public services and around ensuring that people are protected at, at work has been going on for the past 30 years. And again, it's no surprise that this is where businesses have gotten more and more power and have been allowed to restructure their businesses to, to, to basically you know, stop workers from organizing, um, to put the costs of businesses onto individual workers. And essentially, in some ways, what we've seen is that now it's really the responsibility of individual workers to enforce their own rights at work. Because as the funding has gone down, um, the whole system has changed to say, well, you know, um, if you can't go to your employer and say these are my rights, then um, it's actually your fault, and in fact you should be doing it. So the onus is totally on the individual worker. And anyone in this room knows how difficult it is to speak up even when you have a union, right? <laughs> and you're facing concessions and cutbacks at the bargaining table. So imagine what it is like for a worker who doesn't have a union. Um, 
And in fact, when you look at employment standards complaints, over 90% of them happen after the worker has lost their job or walked away. Because anyone who's, you know, it's not rocket science, right? I mean, you know, if you're going to say something and you don't have a union, you're going to be walked out the door because, you know, right now there's thousands and thousands of workers who are out of work right now. But what does this really mean systematically for workers who don't have unions and who do rely on public services like the Employment Standards Branch for protection? Well, it means in uh, you know 2001 to 2005, workers who made a complaint, who officially went through the channels and made a complaint, and, and the government said, yes, you're indeed owed that money. Over $100 million of people's wages were not collected. $100 million. It means that there's 40 employment standards officers to cover over 370,000 workplaces in Ontario. Again, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that that's not going to mean a lot of inspections. And in fact, it's less than 1% chance of a, of a workplace to get inspected right now. And for those employers who are actually found guilty, only 2% of them actually pay a penalty. And guess how much the penalty is? $360. <laughs> yeah, there's an incentive, eh? Um, but who takes the cost? Well, of course, it's workers, right? Um, they have to go into debt. They have to claim bankruptcy. They lose their housing. Um, they can't afford to pay for decent food and pay the bills. Um, we've had worker after worker come into the center where they're, you know, to pay just their rent while they're waiting for their unpaid wages is going on their visa card. And we all know what percentage of interest they're paying. So I think that, how am I for time? One minute? Okay. Um, so I think sort of correspondingly, I think it's important to talk about what's happening to workers also in the employment standards branch. Um, you know, uh, in the last five years, claims that they're having to deal, deal with have gone from like 14,000 to over 25,000 claims during the recession. And so now there's a huge pressure on employment standards officers, which are OPSU members, right, to speed up. And instead of having the time to do the proper investigations, um, there's a pressure that they're having in the system to process claims quicker, to put pressure on workers to settle for less than what they're owed, to push for documentation that workers can provide, especially those who don't speak English, to do inspections that require a self-audit of an employer. Now you tell me, you go into an employer's workplace, you say, here, fill out this self-audit, tell me if you're violating the law. <laughs> but what do you think someone's going to do? It's like saying to me, am I not filing my taxes properly? Well, of course I'm going to say yes, of course I'm filing my taxes properly. They don't do any interviews with workers and there's absolute pressure on officers to, to quickly do their job. Again, who gets screwed? It's workers. And so this is the system. And I think it's really important just to end on, because I think we're not just here to talk about what's at stake and how awful and depressing it is. It's about fighting back. And through our work, we've managed to get a 36% increase in the funds to employment standards. We've gotten um, them to push to do proactive inspections of of sectors where there's work, uh, the worst violators. We've pushed for more protection for temp agency workers and for living caregivers with our work with the Caregivers Action Center. And now we've launched our campaign in May on the stop wage theft. And I think it's really important that we make the links with public service jobs, workers' rights, and those who don't have unions and who rely on public service workers to ensure that they're protected in their workplace. I have a lot of campaign material on there and I just wanted to do a big plug for workers who are being brought into this country without any protections, which are migrant farm workers. They're doing a pilgrimage to freedom on Sunday at the Ministry of Labor. They're gonna have a demonstration at three o'clock and they really need your support because if an employer can get rid of a worker and actually deport them for speaking up, then what power do we have in the workplace? And there's thousands and thousands of workers coming into this province that that is their reality. And, and, and if we don't stand in solidarity with them, then, you know, we might as well just go home, right? So um, that is the information on there. And if those of you who are part of locals or organizations, I also have a campaign kit where you can uh, endorse the campaign, 
get involved and uh, really work together because it's about us fighting for public services but it's also about you guys getting involved in our, in our fight to stop wage theft. Thank you very much.